Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back, I hope, to another episode of Mondays with Mundy. That's me, Jim Mundy, the historian for the Union League Legacy Foundation. Um, this, this video is broadcasting on March 29th, so it's been almost a year that we've been doing these episodes because of COVID, all right? The COVID virus and the pandemic that resulted has forced a lot of, forced almost all of us to do things virtually from now on. Uh, so it's a medical crisis, quite literally. And I've avoided medicine, I think, pretty much over the last year when I've been doing these episodes. But today, uh -uh, we're going into the deep end of the pool on medicine. Actually, it's a little program called Medicine Man, because it turns out that there was a Union League member uh, for over 50 years who was one of the leading medical researchers, pathologists, uh, clinicians, um, inventors, musicians, you name it, he did it all. And he was a member of the league. And so I'm calling this episode the medicine man. So let's take a look, all right? So I'm gonna share my screen once again. And if I do it right, you'll be able to see the PowerPoint. All right, there we go. And it looks like I did it right. Okay, <laughs> after a year, I'm still surprised I get it right. All right, folks, so medicine man it is. So about whom am I speaking? F. William Sunderman, MD, 1898 to 2003, a 104 years old. Although in his mind, he was 104 years young. He was an amazing guy. I mean, I really just have quite a character. So let's find out some more about F. William Sunderman. All right, uh, geez, railroad town, Altoona. He was born in Altoona, Pennsylvania in, in October of 1898. His, parent, well, his father was a German immigrant. He was a baker, so he had a bakery in Altoona and his mother was of German-American background. And if you know anything about Pennsylvania and you know Altoona, you know that it was uh, the main locomotive repair construction shop for the Pennsylvania Railroad, which for much of the 20th century was uh, the world's largest corporation and most successful one at the same time. It was definitely a railroad town. And actually it is still to this day, the largest locomotive repair so, you know, uh, center in North America. So it's still doing that today. So uh, this is where Bill Sunderman grew up. Um, his father gave him some advice. Three things, always buy Pennsylvania Railroad stock, go to church every Sunday, and I forget the third one. <laughs> Leave it to me. I'll remember it in a minute though. But his mother though had other ideas for her son. So she, uh, she brought him a violin when he was five years old and he never stopped playing until the day he died, it seems. so. You never know, do you? So he went to Juniata Elementary School and Juniata High School. And then in 1919, he graduated from Gettysburg College. And this is what it looked like in the early 1920s. So just about the time that, that Bill Sunderman was there. Um, while he was there, uh, he was practicing, he was, doing, he was a musician. I mean, when he was in Altoona, uh, even in high school, he, had a, he would play the violin at the movie theater while they were showing silent movies. And by the time he got to Gettysburg, he had his own band. So at Gettysburg, he led both the army band on campus and the student orchestra at the same time. So, so he, he never lost his affinity for music. And, uh, and we'll see that in a little while too as well. So from Gettysburg College, he went to, actually let me go back to Gettysburg. I think it's important. All right, talk about music. Um, in the early 1990s, uh, Bill Sunderman left Gettysburg College $14 million to create something called the Sunderman Conservatory of Music. It's a degree granting conservatory. Uh, he endowed it entirely. He left them his collection of, of, mu of sheet music, which was extensive, including original scores and things like that over the years. He was also a collector of instruments, specifically violins. Uh, and he left his collection of violins, mostly 18th and 19th century, to Gettysburg, along with the bows. And uh, what he became very famous for in terms of his music was the fact that he owned a 1694 Stradivarius that he called the San Sebastian, St. Sebastian. So, so uh, Gettysburg did very well with Dr. Sunderman. So then he went to Penn Medicine. This is, the, this is today known as the Perlman School of Medicine. But uh, so in 1923, he graduated from Penn with a medical doctor's degree, an MD degree. And uh, he then, then did his internship at Pennsylvania Hospital, but then came back to Penn 
where he became a fellow in the uh, Department of Research Medicine at Penn. So this would begin a, a career with Penn that lasted over a number, over, over a decade at Penn itself. Uh, and by 19, uh, in 1933, he became the director of the William Pepper Clinical Laboratory. And this was a laboratory as it was when Bill was a student and on campus, uh, but it was torn down in the late 1920s and replaced by this building known as the Martin Maloney building, which still stands by the way. And in the building was the William Pepper Clinical Laboratory. So this is where he worked when he was at Penn in the 1930s and the early, early 1940s. Okay. Now during this time, uh, he was a very busy guy, as you can imagine. Uh, you already know that boy, if you can mix music and medicine, you, you've got to have an imagination beyond belief. And, but also there for some kind of a drive, an internal drive that made you do things. And so while he was at, uh, at, at William Pepper Clinical Laboratory, he devised measurements for things like serum cholesterol, glucose, chloride, uh, total proteins, uh, and things like that. He also developed something called the Sunderman glucose tube, which was the first instrument used to measure glucose in a patient's bloodstream or blood system. And of course, nowadays you can't do anything without measuring glucose, right? Uh, he also was one of the earliest users of insulin to bring his patients out of a diabetic coma. So he was a man who was, you know, at this point on the cutting edge of, of medical research. So that's and, that's, and he would spend the rest of his life as a researcher as well. He really never went into, um, practicing medicine as we think of as a GP or something like that. So uh, in 1938 though, medicine would get back with him, so to speak, uh, revenge. He uh, suffered tuberculosis and uh, so suffered some lung damage, but it, which would keep him out of serving in any of the armed services during World War II, but it did allow him, and this is he at that time, this is him in 1947. So this is pretty much what he looked like at that point in time because he became part of the Manhattan Project. So he, um, Actually, during he did a few, did two things during World War II. He served in the U.S. Navy as their uh, in the Office of Scientific Research and Development, and again was studying toxicology. All right, and then he became uh, specifically involved with the Manhattan Project, uh, studying the effects of we hear this one nickel tetracarbonyl, which apparently is one of the most deadly uh, toxic gases known to man, as they say. And it was a byproduct of what the Manhattan Project was creating, which was the nuclear bomb. And so uh, he developed an antidote to it, but he did it by testing it on himself. And that's the kind of researcher he was. So, so that he did all that during, so he was a, a medical director of the Manhattan Project during World War II as well. It's like, holy cow. All right. So after the war between 1947 and 1950, he went to work for the Atomic Energy Commission and he was involved both at Los Alamos, okay, as a, um, he worked as a medical consultant, and then he worked at the Brookhaven National Laboratories as the um, acting medical director. So, so here's a man who mixes medicine and science better than almost anybody else in the country at this point in time. I mean, just absolutely, absolutely amazing what he was doing, okay? What do we have here? Ah, so he was inventing things all the time. Here we have something called, as you can see, the Sunderman Conductivity Bridge. And because I couldn't remember what this thing does, <laughs> I've got to read it. So here we go. Okay, so the Sunderman Conductivity Bridge, and this is about 1950, all right, measures the electromagnetic conductivity of small quantities of biological fluids. It is specifically designed to determine a sample serum's total base and to estimate its serum sodium, which has important clinical implications. I'll take their word for it. But again, you can see though how his creative mind and his just energy was pushing him in new directions all the time. So, and this is part of the legacy that he left behind to clinical medicine. Um, where do I go? What about here? Ah, too soon. All right. So let me do. All right. So let me just recap. So now it's we're we're talking 19 second half of the 1940s. All right. So he's he's working for the Atomic Energy Commission. He's back in Philadelphia, uh, and. Um, while working at the William Pepper Laboratory again after the war. And I've got to read all this because I couldn't memorize this. I tried, I really did, but I couldn't remember half of this stuff, but wait, because he's done so much. So here we go. All right, so at, at beginning in 1946, while at the William Pepper Laboratory at Penn, he introduced quality control techniques in clinical chemistry and established a program of proficiency testing for clinical laboratories throughout the United States. And these are still being used to this day. 
He then served as professor and head of the Department of Clinical Pathology at Temple, 1947 to 1948. And from Temple, he moved on to the Cleveland Clinic, 1948 and 49. And from there, he went to the MD Anderson Cancer Center at the University of Texas in Houston, 1949-1950. And then at the Emory University Medical School in Atlanta between 1950 and 1951. And it was in 1951 that he came back to Philadelphia where he would stay for the rest of his life. So between 1951 and 1971, he became the clinical professor of medicine and director of the Division of Metabolic Research at Jefferson Medical College here in Philadelphia. Okay. So he retired, he didn't really, he never really retired. Uh, but let's just say that after 1971, I'll keep at this point, he's 73 years old and he's still going strong. So at that point, he um, just started uh, becoming a journal editor because he was involved in many, many different professional journals, many of, some of which he actually uh, uh, founded himself. So this is just a, a small sampling of what he was doing in the 1940s and the 19th, actually up, up until the end of the 20th century. So he served as a founding governor of the just in 1951. He was the Association of Clinical Scientists from 1956 to 1988, uh, organizing their annual uh, workshops and things like that. Science from its creation in 1971 until 1999, and a member of the executive committee until between 1956 and 2003, that, literally the year he died. So you can see how here was a man who just didn't stop thinking, acting, and moving. So, but anyway, so the league. All right. Now, in the meantime, I just, you know, all that time, he wrote over 350 medical articles, scientific papers, over 16 scientific books. All right. And he also wrote books of leisure, if you will, a book on photography, a book on music. Uh, he did travel and he did two little show at the end of the talk in just a few minutes. Okay. So it's 1998. He's 100 years old and the Union League awarded him the gold medal, only the 14th league member in the history of the league, organized in 1862 to receive the gold medal of the league itself. And that is Dr. Sunderman on the left-hand side with Mr. Thomas Pappas, who was the league president in 1998. And you can see the gold medal around Dr. Sunderman's neck. And you can see his, looks like a Phi Beta Kappa chain there as well. And this is Dr. Sunderman receiving the medal from, from Tom Pappas. And Dr. Sunderman, of course, gave a few words. And as you can imagine, he was a man of many words, right? And this is Dr. Sunderman in his office at Jeff. All right. And you can see on his coat, MD, PhD, and he was darn proud of it. And why not? So uh, in 1998, um, there was an organization uh, that, uh, and I forget the name of it offhand, uh, but it proclaimed him the oldest worker in America. That is, there was nobody else 100 years old who was still working every day of the week, but Bill Sunderman was. And so he got that award. Okay. Pretty neat stuff, isn't it? All right. So 100 years old, they had a birthday party for him at the lake. And this is unfortunately was the only photograph I could find from the birthday party. Uh, and this is he with one of his colleagues from the University of Virginia School of Medicine. So, so that was Bill Sunderman at his 100th birthday party at the league, which would have been October 23rd, if I remember correctly. And here, music, his violins. Again, as I mentioned, um, he owned a, a, a 1694 Stradivarius called the Saint, the Saint Sebastian, the San Sebastiano. Um, and Dr. Sunderman actually performed in a musical concert with his son, F. William Sunderman Jr., who's also, uh, the two of them were concert level amateur violinist, and they performed at Carnegie Hall in New York uh, in the late 1990s, uh, which is, I mean, how many people get to do that at, in any way, shape or form at any time in their lives? And then this is, this is Dr. Sunderman at his 100th birthday party. So this was taken in October, shortly after. So, so 
what a shame. Um, so this was, no, this was the birthday party in 2002 because he would die, oh shucks, uh, March the 9th of 2003. So this was, all right. So what a character. I hope you've enjoyed learning about another league member who I think is just, you know, just an amazing contributor to American history, to medical history, to Philadelphia and to the league itself. Now, these are two of his books. Um, this one is called Our Madeira Heritage. And beginning in the, in the 18th century, Philadelphia was the center of Madeira drinking in, in the country. And there's, it's a wonderful book if you get the chance to read it. Um, you know, it ends with the poem, have a little Madeira, my dear. Uh, try some, it's really good stuff. And then here we have A Time to Remember, an autobiography that he wrote in 1988. So it's pretty much up to speed. It's a really good book. Uh, we have the Madeira book in the library. We didn't have his autobiography, but I purchased it online. So hopefully it'll be in the library within a week. If nobody wants to read it, I encourage you to read it. And I encourage you to get to know Dr. Sunderman a little better. Uh, really um, just remarkable, remarkable individual and human being. So, and glad he was a member of the Union League. So, so that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed learning about another league member. Uh, we'll do it again sometime, no doubt. And uh, in the meantime, there's a week to go before the next episode. So in that time, get out, get your vaccine, stay well, stay safe. Thank you for supporting these episodes and thank you to the Legacy Foundation for sponsoring these. So with all that then, thanks for watching. Goodbye and stay well.